Welcome to week three of the Fun Prevention Challenge. This week is Attract Fun, and I'm really thrilled to be here with everyone. Thank you for making the time out of your Monday afternoon and your Valentine's Day to, uh, to have some fun with us. Um, I'm absolutely thrilled to have Lori Santos with me here today. And I wanted to encourage you, if you've got questions for Lori during this chat, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen so that she and I know where to look at the end. You can also continue to share delights and comments in the side, but if you have questions that you want us to answer, put them on the bottom. So it is my personal delight to welcome today, Lori Santos, who is a professor at Yale. She teaches the most popular course in the university's history, which I wish had been, been available when I was there, which is called Psychology and the Good Life, which it's crazy how popular it is to the point that it's a free course on Coursera that you can all check out that I believe has been taken by more than 3.3 million people. And Lori is also the host of the Happiness Lab podcast, which is how I met her, which is all about investigating what happiness actually is and the science behind what it means and how we can be happier. Um, and that has over 48 million downloads. Is that true, Lori? Yes, that's crazy. right. I'm okay. <laughs> and so she's got all sorts of other accomplishments and, and I could go on and on and praise her, but I, I want to get right to the cut right to the chase. I met Lori a couple of years ago, pre-pandemic, when we connected over how to break up with your phone and we started talking about screen life balance. Then we established my in-laws live in Hamden. We got to meet in person. We talked about fun. And then Lori ended up being the first ever subject in an official fun intervention that she then turned into an amazing double episode on the Happiness Lab. So it's been a true delight for me over the past two years to get to know Lori, both professionally, but also personally. And I'm so excited to get to have her tonight with us on this call to talk about all things fun. So Lori, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you so much for having me. It, I'm sure it is going to be fun to <laughs> <laughs> set ourselves up for a pressure. So yeah. the first thing I wanted to ask you before we get into the details of fun. It's kind of a strange question, but why do you think your course is the most popular in the university's whole history? Putting aside the fact that you're obviously an amazing teacher, but like why the need for this class? Yeah, I mean, I think we're all looking for ways to feel happier. You know what I mean? We were all looking for ways to feel happier before, but I feel like the modern age, especially the like post COVID age means that we're all looking for these kind of strategies. Um, and I think these days college students are suffering much more than we all expect. You know, so one national survey of college students reported that college students uh, of college students, around 40% report being so depressed it's difficult to function most days. Over 60% say they're overwhelmingly anxious. Over 80% report feeling overwhelmed most of the time. And more than one in 10 has seriously considered suicide in the last year. So this is not a Yale, this is like national statistics. So this is like really bad. You know, we we'd sometimes think like, oh, you know, college students are a bunch of, you know, quote unquote snowflakes, but like we're dealing with like a major mental health crisis that's on our hand among young people today. And so I think that's part of why the course resonated so much. It was like offering students these like practical and evidence-based strategies that they could use to feel better. Was it popular right from the start? Because it's interesting to me, psychology and the good life, it's like you had to put kind of a, an intellectual sounding name on yeah. it. Yeah. Well, I like, I mean, the yeah. good life I think was like, you know, popped out of the, the blue book as we call our course catalog, you know? Right. And so, yeah, the first time we taught it, it's funny, you, it, as a Yale professor, students don't like register for your classes in advance. We have this thing that we call shopping period where you can kind of check out the courses a little bit first and so on. But but professors get this little like ticker that's telling you how many students are looking at your course. And all the other professors went from zero to 100 students. But I knew something was wrong with mine because my like access went from zero to 1,000 students. It was like a difference in like an order of magnitude. Um, and so even, even from the very start of this class, you know, we couldn't fit in any classroom on Yale's campus. We had to teach the class in a concert hall. It was all really surreal, but you know, it, it told me, it showed me that students are voting with their feet. They don't like this culture of feeling stressed out and depressed and anxious. And I think they just wanted some strategies they could use to feel better. And so that was true even before the pandemic though, because this started several years beforehand. Yeah, it was almost prescient to be thinking about the science of happiness, you know, like in 2018, which is when I first taught this class, you know, now it feels like these kinds of pressures are even worse. We're facing so much more like frustration of all these lockdowns and changes, all this uncertainty of when is this gonna end? And, you know, am I gonna get sick, right? You know, these are the kinds of things we face all the time. So I think that the, the pressures on campus were there before COVID and they haven't gotten better during COVID either. Okay, so you're 
if I may say so, the professor of happiness. Yeah. We're, we're <laughs> I'll expert on happiness. If you get, get this is the professor of fun, then I'll go with professor of happiness. You, okay, or like guru. Or, you fun know, guru but you, fun, you know yeah. a lot about happiness. So why why did you need more fun? I remember one of the times we first talked about this. You mentioned to me that you had a whiteboard in your office and that your husband was making fun of you because it was like <laughs> at the bottom of it, it said like to do like in the future, have fun. <laughs> So yeah, what, what what was it about fun that I think he was making fun of me, fun. but also but also like hopeful, like, oh, eventually we're gonna get to fun, right? Like it's on the to-do list. No, I mean, I think, you know, I mean, you've seen this too, right? Like, you know, there's so many things in our life that we prioritize. We prioritize our work, we prioritize just like getting through the day. We have all these like accolades and you know achievements that we want to go for we don't often plan in the fun parts right and and if we're not careful just the normal demands of life can take over right it's, especially now i mean before covid it was bad too but now that we're you know dealing with our kids and you know, school is closed again and we got to figure out you know there's just like a bunch of stuff that life throws our way and it feels like it can get tricky to prioritize fun right it's important but it at least for me it's the thing that falls by the wayside if i'm not careful so do you feel like this might get very philosophical, so go with this where you will, but, but the difference between happiness and fun, because you're definitely an intellectual expert on mm -hmm. happiness, but I'm just wondering what it was, yeah, that made you feel that this was missing from your life personally. Yeah, well, I'll give you, I mean, if you want to get philosophical, I'll give you the definition of, of happiness that lots of social okay. scientists. Okay, which so is, just drops the, and I know you have yeah, like, just like, right, like yeah. nerd it up even more, right? But yeah, yeah. yeah so ha social scientists think of happiness as, kind of some combination of being happy in your life and with your life, you know, so happy in your life includes all kinds of positive emotions and feelings and states of which I think fun is definitely a big one, right? Like you're, in, you're laughing, you're having joy, you're having all these things that feel good, or at least the ratio of those to the negative emotional states is pretty good. That's kind of ha being happy in your life. But then there is also being happy with your life, which is that your life has a sense of purpose or meaning. You feel like you're living your life the best, most satisfying way possible. Um, I think when we think about fun, it, it kind of fits into both of those ultimately. I mean, definitely fun in your life is critical, right? I think half the laughter I have, half of the positive emotion I experience are often in states of fun when I'm achieving fun. Or like if I think of highest po positive emotion, it tends to come in the context of fun. But I also think ultimately having a life that's satisfying and meaningful is going to require a, a certain degree of fun, right? Like in some ways, fun is the thing that makes life you know most meaningful. I love your story about this in the book when you had this moment that you were like you know waiting for death <laughs> like you know it's like like when you really again with like life is finite for better or for worse and when we think when we think from that perspective you want to figure out okay what do I want to put into this to feel satisfying and I think in that list you're going to have some achievements and big things but hopefully you're just going to have these smaller moments of fun too and so so I think that fun winds up fitting into a happy life in both of those ways it's kind of the local in the moment happiness but it also builds you a life that is worth living yeah it's interesting because one of the things I personally thought was the most interesting when I started writing about fun was this connection between fun and happiness because when I read through people's stories of, or hear people talk about the times in which they had the most fun they're inevitably happy or invariably mm -hmm. happy which made me think like, huh, maybe the secret to happiness is in the everyday pursuit of fun. So it's been really interesting to hear your perspective on that. Um, one of the things I've heard you speak about in terms of happiness that I thought was really relevant in terms of fun as well was the element of connection. And I was wondering if you could talk a bit about what connection has to do with happiness yeah, I mean, in the big list, you know, in my class, I teach this like big list of like, these are behaviors that can promote happiness and social connection is always at the top of the list. Why? It's because literally every available study of happy people shows that happy people are more social. If you just have people do time budgets of how they're spending their time, whether it's exercising or in prayer or working or whatever, what you find is that the happiest people tend to spend more of that time being social, either with close friends and family members or just like literally around other people. Like the the very happiest people are more social. And there's all these studies where you intervene and you like force people to be a little bit more social. What you find is that that winds up making them happier, much against their intuitions. People think if I'm forced to say, talk to a, a stranger on the train, that that's gonna feel 
awkward and weird and whatever, but when you force people to do it, they wind up feeling happier. And so I think, you know, to the extent that fun works best when we're being social or that that being social is a necessary condition of fun, I think it just is yet another reason that fun feels so good and winds up making us so happy, right? It's like just another component that's like allowing us to be a little bit more social and social in like a good way. It's not like you're having some boring conversation with some stranger on the train about the weather, which is already good for your well-being. You're probably doing something that requires you to be really present, that you're kind of being really playful with, and you're having these kind of appropriate emotions of curiosity and sort of checking in and creativity, right? And so but you're doing all that in a social context and just the social part alone is good for happiness. But I think when you add those other elements to it, it just gets even better. And is that true for introverts as well as extroverts in the research? Yeah, in terms this, of- this is a question that comes up a lot. In fact, the, the, I did a whole podcast episode on what I call uh, the title of which was mistakenly seeking solitude, where we kind of get, you know, if you think like, oh, I had a bad day at work, what do I want to do? Like, I just want to be by myself or I just want to like plop down and watch Netflix or something. Not that there's anything wrong with Netflix, but the point is that what the science shows is we'd be better off on those in those moments if we sought out some social connection but we don't think that like our intuition there is wrong. And so, you know, put out this podcast episode and I got all these like angry emails from people like, you know, you only say that because you're an extrovert. It turns out I'm not actually that much of an extrovert. I like my alone time and really thrive in that too. Um, but what the science shows is that, that in fact, social connection is important for introverts and extroverts. That that talking to strangers on a train study I mentioned, it's a lovely study by the psychologist Nick Epley at the University of Chicago. And he actually measured people's introversion and extroversion. And what he finds is that when you talk to somebody on a train, you get just as much of a happiness boost, whether you're an introvert or an extrovert. The difference is that if you look at introverts' predictions about whether or not they'll be happy, those predictions are very, very low. Like not just like, I won't get happy, but like below baseline, like I'll be actively miserable. Whereas extroverts don't predict it's gonna make them that happy, but they don't think it's gonna make them miserable. And so it seems like the difference between introverts and extroverts, at least in Nick Epley's hands, is that the difference isn't about the happiness boost you get from being social it's about your predictions. So say I'm, I'm like a full on introvert. I think about I'm on this train. Should I talk to somebody? I'm like, that's going to feel yucky. So I never do it. And I never get the benefit of seeing that I was wrong. And then I keep not doing it. And so you kind of miss out. And so yeah, happiness benefits that come from being social come to, to introverts too. You might need to think about how you do it. Maybe if you're an introvert, it's not like, you know, the party with 600 people where you're just like talking to strangers, but like the close kind of social connection that feels good is going to feel good to you, even if you're an introvert. Yeah, it was interesting to look at that and the responses I got when I was asking people what fun experiences, because I asked people point blank, like, is there anything that surprised you about the stories you just shared with me? And it was really interesting, just what you're saying. A number of people said, I'm a self-proclaimed introvert, but all the stories I just told you involved other people. And it Mm -hmm. surprised them. Um, That's really interesting. Yeah. No, I was going to say, I mean, I think, I think that's one of the things I think is so cool about the, the fun audit. And I'm getting all my Yale students to do a fun audit now, because I think it's so powerful. I think you, we, we just have these in, bad intuitions about what we're going to enjoy. Um, and I think there's some interesting like neuroscientific data about why this is like, this is one of the things I hate most about the human brain is that we know that there's <laughs> just one of the things, just one, one, of, the things. one of the things I okay. think it's, actually, it's pretty up there. I think it might be, it's definitely top five, probably top three. Um, but the <laughs> top three thing I hate most about the human brain is there's a disconnect in our brain between circuits that code for what you might call wanting or craving or being motivated to do something and the circuits that allow for liking that thing, you know? So what do I mean, right? So, you know, I probably have, you know, and we've talked about this before in our context of screen life balance, I have incredible wanting for using my phone, right? You know, we're having this nice conversation. My phone's just out of reach. If it binged or like just lit up ever, or even just talking about it now, I can oh, no. watch <laughs> craving, a craving coming online for using my phone, right? Like incredible wanting for it. But if I pick it up and I start scrolling Reddit or something stupid, I'm not going to really like that very much, right? And this is true in all kinds of contexts. You know, I often think about like sweet food and stuff. Like I can get incredible, I have such a sweet tooth. I get incredible cravings for like a cupcake or we're talking about Valentine's Day, right? Like Valentine's chocolates, which are just all over my, you know, college, like residential college right now. Incredible craving for that. Like a real strong wanting signal. But when I eat it, 
like it's fine it's not bad but it, it didn't like match the craving i get for it and so this is, these are cases where we like want 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 stuff that we're not going to actually like but i think there's also cases where we really like stuff that we don't have strong signals to want and i think for a lot of us social connection and a lot of the fun factors you talk about are like this right ultimately if i really did this i would like it a lot you know i get a tremendous amount of pleasure from it but i don't end up wanting it Right. And I think certain challenging kinds of fun are like that. I think just getting away from our screens are like that, right? Like a lot of the fake fun has strong wanting signals, but like not so much liking signals. And so, yeah. So I think we wouldn't need your book if we could like just put, like, why did natural selection not like put these circuits together? Like you'd think you'd build a brain with like lots of pleasure and that the wanting would go with the pleasure, but. It just, it doesn't fully work that way, which is, it's dumb. It's a dumb way to design a brain. That's so funny that maybe yeah, if it did work that way, that we would both be out of jobs, but then maybe we'd have more time to just go and live our own messages. Yeah, we'd just be liking everything. So be yeah, good. exactly. Well, I think it's interesting because that, that does speak to one of the main obstacles that stands in the way of happiness and fun. And it's interesting. I don't know if anyone on this call has had this um, experience themselves. Well, one thing that my husband and I have been talking about is that he talks typically doesn't think that he likes social he likes connection. connection are other people getting, are other people getting an echo my own echo my own ear i'm good i don't hear it, you're so. good okay yeah um he doesn't think he likes social connection but he he said the other day that the lack of the ability to have people over you know has actually made him he's very introvert he used to leave parties that we were hosting and i would find him in bed reading a book <laughs> like that level of thing he's like i actually really do care about social connection but i'm wondering while we're talking about things that our obstacles in our pursuit of, of happiness and fun. If you could also talk a bit about time and what we get wrong about how we think about time, particularly in terms of work and leisure. Yeah, I think we just simply don't value time at all, just in general, right? And there's lovely work by the Harvard psychologist, Ashley Willens about this, that like, you know, we, we think of money is super, super valuable. Most of us, if you gave us the opportunity to double or triple our salary, would take it in a heartbeat, even if that came at the expense of having some extra free time. Um, but we don't seem to value time in the same way. But all of the available studies suggest that one big path to happiness is having a little bit more free time. It's what social scientists call time affluence, which is, interestingly, the subjective sense that you have a lot of free time. It's not your objective amount of free time, because that can vary. You know, we've all had the case where, like, some random meeting is canceled and it feels like you've got like this whole world of time has opened up and you could go skiing or learn a new language but it's like it's just half hour <laughs> like on some Monday right but it just feels like oh my gosh right that's time affluence and it's the opposite of what most of us have which is called time famine we were literally starving for time and time famine the science suggests works a lot like hunger famine, where you're just triaging stuff. You're just trying to get stuff off your desk. You know, when you're hungry and starving, you're probably not seeking out, you know, exploratory opportunities or things to engage your curiosity. And, and time famine seems to work the same way. It just means we're like, not seeking out fun stuff. Cause we're just like, I just got to get the next thing checked off my list. Right. And we feel so overwhelmed. Um, it seems. Totally. And I think the overwhelm hits on an, another feature of, of fun that you've talked a lot about, right, which is presence, right? Like when I'm feeling overwhelmed and I've got no time, like I just can't be present. I'm just like triaging stuff. I'm getting, I'm multitasking, right? Like I'm having a Zoom call with you, but I'm trying to like check email on the side so you can't see that I'm doing it, right? Like these are the kinds of things we do, but that's like an immediate hit to the kind of flow that you need to enjoy things and to, to kind of engage in fun. Um, but interestingly, there's another hit that comes with feeling really time famished, which is that you also feel less social. Um, there's like some elegant experiments that put people under time pressure. And what you find is that people want to be less social then. They feel like they should work more. Um, they do this funny study where they just have people unscramble words that either remind you about time, like kind of time is money, or you unscramble words that like remind you of some other random thing. And what you find is like just students in a coffee shop who've done this are less social when they've unscrambled the like time is money kind of words because they kind of feel like I just have to work. I don't have any free time, right? And so there is also this interesting connection with free time and being social, which of course relates to fun because fun by necessity seems to be social. And I actually think that this is a spot we were talking today about attracting fun, where we really need to think more about the way to attract fun is to open up our calendars. Like we just simply can't have fun if we're just dealing with these like tiny pieces of time here and there. We need to find ways to like have the expanse so we have time to become present, so we have time to enjoy, so we have time to like 
call that person so we could connect with them and figure out, hey, when are we going to meet up to like play mahjong or whatever, or do a sing along or whatever it's going to be. I think that time pressure and the time pressure that we all feel right now is actually one of the biggest barriers to attracting fun. And we don't often talk about it. We think we can't change it, right? So it's hard to to switch around. And I think it's, it's just a huge barrier. Um, so for me, when I was thinking about why I don't have fun, that was one of the biggest reasons is I'm just busy all the time with stuff that doesn't always feel fun. And it sounded like your time was really chopped up into little pieces. What I think, is it Bridget um, Schultz, who was quoted in mm-hmm. Ashley Willen's book, calls time confetti, which I think is a great yeah, term. Which is one of my favorite terms, right? It's like the five minutes when that Zoom meeting ends or the 10 minute when your kids fall asleep early. And one of the reasons researchers care about time confetti is that it turns out we have more of it than we ever have before but so much so that we wind up having more time than we ever have had before not necessarily during covid but like if you look 50 years ago people had less free time then than we do now but it doesn't feel like we have a lot of free time because it's like chopped up you know it's like we have this huge sheet of paper but it's in these like tiny little pieces and we can't really do anything with it and i think this is the spot where the fake fun seeps in you know if i have 5 minutes it feels really easy to just like check my email or to pull up some social media app and just like scroll through a feed, right? Because it feels like, well, five minutes, I can't really call a friend or if I'm thinking about the other happiness practices I encourage, I can't really do something that's like true social connection or like exercise or something that would really boost my happiness. So like, meh, I'll just do some something stupid. Um, I'll do a wanting thing that I'm not gonna like very much. And so I think we need to kind of find either find ways to harness our time confetti or make sure we get bigger expanses of free time to try to engage in fun more. Yeah, it's interesting what you're saying about the way that this, this problem with our brains, top three problems with our brains design really does have a, it seems to work against us in multiple ways where we're really tempted by these distractions, by the wanting. And then the result is that our time is chopped up and then that makes it even harder to pursue the things that we intellectually might know would make us feel better, but don't have that same kind of dopamine induced motivation behind it. Totally. That's right. And what we know from the wanting, the wanting system also gets more, tr- more freaked out and more energized. Like, so you end up craving stuff more when you're in a state of famine, right? Like think about the wanting system that might want the cupcake, right? When you're depleted and you're tired and you're exhausted, like you're going to go for the, you're going to fall prey to that craving, that wanting much more. And Mm -hmm. given that all our devices are built on the wanting, like they suck our time away and then we feel time pressured and time famished and then we want to use them more and yeah, horrible cycle. So we're all, we're all screwed. So this is why <laughs> making time, <laughs> making the space for fun oh, is so important. No, yeah, yeah. But I, I mean, I think, I want, oh, go ahead. It takes work. I mean, this is what we, what the main message of my happiness class, and thank you all those folks in the chat who are putting that you took my class or you listened to my podcast and you enjoyed it. Really appreciate that. Um, but the main message is like, this stuff takes work, right? It's like fun is fun, but you kind of got to set up the right, you know, the mood for it so that it can strike a little bit easier. So it's not that it's not possible or that we're screwed it's just like like all good things in life it just like takes some work you know you're not going to have a super delicious dinner that just like you know you didn't have to work to you know pay some restaurant to do or you didn't create yourself like it's not just going to like happen and I think the same is true for so many good things in life including fun like it's helpful to like set the stage and put in a little bit of work to set the stage to, to light the candles, if you will. To light the candles. So <laughs> romantic. Well, I'm, I'm glad to hear you say that because like, yeah, I think it is so hard to conceptually get over the hump where it's like, you do have to work a little bit harder to have fun, but then it's supposed to be fun. So you shouldn't have to work, but it's like, well, there's so many easy temptations. So I wanted to ask you um, in terms of practical stuff we can do, as you know, in this chapter about attracting fun, I talk about creating more of a fun mindset and then also creating more structures that facilitate fun which I know overlaps a lot with what you, you do in professionally and have thoughts on. So I'm wondering if you have any suggestions about how we can shift our mindsets. As I know you've said that mindset is one of the most important elements when it comes to our perceived happiness. And it also has to do with fun. Yeah, totally. I mean, I think one of the mindset shifts that at least in my fun intervention with you is so critical for finding more fun is a mindset shifts, mindset shift towards more <laughs> have to say, get you into sure. trouble, that shift uh, towards more self-compassion, right? Um, you know, I think a, a fun killer is judgment. 
And so many of us live very judgy lives right now, often in our own heads, right? Like we're our own drill sergeants yelling at ourselves for like not being better or not being prettier or not being perfect or not being good at a, a good at this sort of thing yet. And that's just like not great for fun, right? And so often, you know, we bring that kind of mindset with us just from our daily life or from work and we try to plop down and do something fun and like that mindset is just getting in the way. And so I think naturally pr like practicing self-compassion, not just in whatever fun playground you find yourself in, but in your normal life, you know, like in your work life or in your family life, those kinds of strategies can be really useful to allow yourself the space that you need and the lack of judgment that you need to kind of engage in fun. And so really simple ways to promote self-compassion are just to like notice how you talk to yourself. You know, are you talking to yourself in a kind of drill sergeant mode um, or are you using some kindness? You know, are you giving yourself the option to grow? Do you feel like you have to be fixed and perfect right now? Or can you take on a little bit more of what's called a growth mindset when you're like, oh, I'm not good at this, but I'm not good at this yet, right? These subtle shifts, they sound really tiny, but they can really get you in a headspace and a mindset of like, okay, I don't have to be perfect at this. I'm just screwing around. Like, it doesn't matter. Like the whole goal of this is to have fun. And that can kind of open up the playfulness that we really need to engage in fun. Um, I think another mindset that so many of us need to get into is a mindset of presence, of noticing things. This is why I love that we started with delights, all the delights that came through. I'm like, oh yeah, dogs' butts, they wiggle. Or like, yes, yeah, no, like it's been outside for like three days and I haven't had a moment to be like, hey, I'm present with this and noticing it, right? Like you kind of have to be there to have fun, to engage in like practices like flow and so on. And so just doing something that shifts your attention to stuff that's fun, that's there right now that you can savor, I think just that mindset shift can be really powerful. And again, it can be like, you know, meditating or doing all these practices, but it can be as easy as taking time to notice, like what's something that's there in your life right now. That's cool. That's funny. That's absurd. That's delightful. And just like forcing yourself to pay attention to it can be a good shift to start practicing like, oh, we're in the moment now we're noticing stuff. Now we're noticing the good stuff now, right? We're kind of training our brain to pay attention to the fun stuff. Is there a benefit to sharing that? Oh, definitely. Because then you get the social connection too, right? You know, and I think you get a, a happiness boost beyond just the like fun connection you might have where, you know, often sharing delights with other people is kind of nice. Like you put other people laugh and you get to see the effect of that. And there's so much evidence that, you know, we, we think of happiness as self-care, but happiness is often other care. It's doing nice stuff for other people, you know, and, and I think that moment where you share the absurd thing or you like just have this real connection about something totally ridiculous like that's wonderful it's like you know like true true human like deep joy comes from that stuff Lori and I are on our, on our own fun text delight chain, which people on these calls probably know I've been really endorsing. And uh, one of my favorites of Lori's delights, if you'd like to tell us yourself about your little bird friend. Oh, yes, yes. It's, it's kind of a like slightly vulgar delight, but I was off on vacation near this beach and this beautiful little bird showed up on my fence. And I was like, that's so nice. This bird is here. And then he just like took a dump and flew away. And I was like, that is hilariously funny. It's just like so funny. Um, another one of my delights that's related to the snow, which so many of you put in the chat is I'm really into tiny snowmen right now. You know, I live in the Northeast in Connecticut and we get snow, but sometimes we don't get that much snow. But I have all these students who are like from California and stuff and they've really wanted be able to make a snowman but there's just like not enough snow so they'll make a snowman that's like you know like seven inches tall and like and then it kind of melts so it's sort of crappy but like you know leftover snowmen very tiny snowmen I just think it's a delight it's like a human exercise of forcing creativity even when you don't have the raw materials just a delight I love that I love that yeah and Lori texted me a picture or showed me a picture of one of these tiny snowmen and I've been thinking about it since <laughs> The delight that someone shared with me today that I thought was very funny, a friend of mine has been sending me things that her Amazon account recommends, like people who like this also like that. And she had bought an eye mask, a sleep mask. And it was like, people who bought this also bought like police grade handcuffs. And she was like, <laughs> oh yeah, I know. I just really, I just wanted it to sleep. It wasn't like a fetish. And I was just thinking, is that how you know you're like middle-aged and getting boring when like the sleep mask is just the sleep mask? So I thought it'd be kind of a funny meme for something, but um but before we, move on to the, before we move on to the structures for fun, I was wondering if you can tell us a bit about the self-compassion and how you kind of put these things into action when you tried surfing. 
Yeah. Well, one thing was I took a page out of your book and talked to Tom Vanderbilt, who I know you just talked to very recently. So he was super helpful for me. Um, Just reminding me that like, you know, it's okay to be a beginner. There's lots of good parts about being a beginner. You know, that's how you learn. That's how you get better. And so I think for me, it was partly getting into like a learning mindset rather than a performance mindset. Like I can suck at this because you have to suck at it. And that's the way you get better at it but also to just get into a fun mindset. Like this isn't, you know, about me being amazing at this. It's really just about embracing the fun, embracing the absurdity of the fun part because one of my fun factors is definitely absurdity. Um, So I was partly picking something that was like really absurd to do. And for me, this absurd thing was uh, trying to learn how to surf, which Catherine has met me. So she knows how deeply uncoordinated I am and how deeply like not- I do not think that I do, I (laughs) object, objection. We've never tried to surf together. Anyway, other people I know you know think you're uncoordinated. I know you think you're hiking uncoordinated. together. So I know you see. But yeah, but in my own brain, I'm like, this is not something I would be good at. This is something that's completely ridiculous. Um, but it allowed me to reconnect with one of my college roommates. It allowed me to embrace a lot of absurdity. I kind of use my body. Beaches are just some, a fun factor for me. It just feels like sand and surf and water, just like kind of cool. Um, yeah, so all those things were awesome. And I took a surf lesson for the first time. And as Catherine knows, I'm taking a brief break from my responsibilities as a Yale professor and taking a sabbatical next year. And most of the places I'm looking at to spend my sabbatical have some like strong surfing potential. So I'm hoping that I'll- surfing on your sabbatical? That's yes. That's a private conversation, but let's awesome. do that. <laughs> Um, my one of two of my favorite things about uh, Lori's surfing experience was one she sent me a picture again delight text chain of her with some friends on the surfboards and the look of joy on their faces just made <laughs> me light up it was so amazing and the other thing I really loved is that Lori I remember that um, was it was it CBS this morning that was doing like a feature on you and the podcast at that point and they're like hey we have a great idea why don't we film you surfing and you're like yeah so the thing about not feeling like I'm going to embarrass myself in front of a big audience like I'm actually going to say no to that and I thought that's real that's self-awareness there because what would not be fun trying to learn how to surf for the first time like in front of all of CBS this not fun, so. for me being in a bathing suit on national television doing something I'm really not great at doing I could see this not playing out so well. like I haven't done the research on that specific thing but I could say for me that certainly <laughs> wouldn't be a fun factor and it was reasonable to say that most people so I thought that was so funny but you know like God put the boundaries down um so before we move on to a brief Q&A so people if you've got any questions drop them into the Q&A for us but I did want to talk to you about the second aspect of this attracting fun so we just talked about shifting our mindsets right trying to be more self compassionate, trying to focus a bit more on the positive, find moments of absurdity, or just things that are, bring you a smile. Um, so that's kind of a mindset shift. But I also wanted to talk about how we create structures for fun. And in my book, I refer to them as playgrounds, which I think can be kind of a difficult thing to kind of grasp. But I was wondering if you can talk a bit about like that concept, props for fun, structures for fun, how that counterintuitive, again, to deliberately put work into creating something for fun, but how that can work in real life. Yeah, I mean, I think we all have these situations where just like something about the environment makes it easier for us to do stuff that's sort of fun. Like take snow, right? Like, you know, those of you who've seen snow, you go out and like when it's snowing for the first time and instantly someone around you is probably going to make a snowball, right? Like, I think it's partly our experience as kids. It's partly it's novel. I mean, snow is kind of ridiculous and delightful in its own way, but just its presence causes you to do something where it's like, I'm just going to like have a random fight, you know, a play, a playful fight with these random people around me. I'm going to get creative and like quickly make something right. You know, all these things that we know are kind of fun things to do. And it's not like anything, the thing that changed was like, there's just snow around. So it just made it easier for me to get creative and make a mini snowman or, you know, have a snowball fight or just like fall on the ground and make a snow angel. Right. Like these are the things that even adults who tend not to have fun a lot of the time do when there's snow on the ground. The key is that you can find ways to create your own like snow, like not literally snow, but just like stuff that when it's around, you like do goofy stuff. Like I know Catherine, you've talked about having like bubbles, like just having a bubbles thing around. Like if there's like a little thing of bubbles, you might be like bubbles and you'll just like take it out and blow some bubbles and then there'll be bubbles and people will comment on it and it'll be fun. Um, I think there are all these like tiny things we can do in our spaces to make things a little bit like more playful, more fun. Have you ever been to a restaurant? I think this is intended for children, but sometimes you go to a restaurant and they like have like 
crayons or you could like write on the like paper tablecloth like but like adults do this too and it winds up being fun you like draw something stupid and so I mean all of these are playing into like my fun factors I like being creative I like you know doing these kinds of things with like for like a baby snowman I like absurdity but you can kind of figure out what your own fun parts are and then add things around you that just make that a little bit easier to engage with And I think we can all just do that. I mean, we naturally structure our environments and there's so much evidence that the environment that we have around us is just shaping our behavior in ways we don't expect. Like a lot lot of times in bad ways, right? You know, go to a grocery store and know how they're shaping your environment by putting certain food at eye level or making things more colorful or so on. We can be doing the same thing with our environment just to make it a little bit more fun. Lori, do you happen to have any props that you could share with us? <laughs> you know, I do because we did our sing along. So, one of my props that I think is amazing are inflatable microphones. Um, I, you, we do lots of events in my residential college at Yale that involve inflatable microphones because I feel like once you have them and there's music on, you can't help but sing along with these things. Um, I also was telling Catherine, I recently, so we have. Um, rivalries between our residential colleges at Yale um, and my residential college recently got like whooped very badly um, in a snowball fight by the other residential college. Were they tiny, like, tiny snowballs, Lori? Like, they were tiny snowballs. It was actually one of the big snowstorms. So it was like, it, they, they, they hit us bad. So I'm like, what can I do to get back to them? And I decided to buy my students a bunch of like big super soakers, which are these like big water guns, but it's like, no one's going to hit someone with, it's just like ridiculous to have a water gun that looks like, you know, sort of Uzi or something. And so the idea is this actually got back to a moment of fun uh, that I remember quite well when I was in grad school, um, where uh, this grad school friend of mine who, who, who also was very good at creating playgrounds for fun. He was this Australian guy. Um, and one of the playgrounds he created for fun was he put these um, spokes on the back of his bike so that someone could stand on it. Like, so they could go riding around with him standing on the back of the bike, um, which was kind of fun because then it makes it social. People see you standing on a bike and they kind of engage with you because they think that's sort of funny. Um, but he also had super soakers. So he went around our grad school town with like these super soakers. And when people see you on a bike holding a big super soaker and it's a summer day, they kind of yell at you like, hey, splash me. And then you do it. <laughs> and fun is had by all or mostly by the people spraying people, but yeah. Well, I think it's really interesting. Yeah, it's the idea is to basically, and everyone could brainstorm about this tonight. It's like, what are the settings that make you behave in a more playful way that let you let down your guard? How can you yeah. create those settings more often? How can you put yourself in those environments more often? And then also, what are the props for fun? Like, what are some things you could actually put into the environment that would make people, including yourself, feel better able to let down their guard? And one example from my own life is that I organized these uh, camp weekends for friends over the summer. And I did that last year in like kind of a COVID lull. And one of the things I did was I brought embroidery floss to make friendship bracelets. I, I can't remember if I've shown this already in one of these calls, but so I didn't know what people were going to do with it. It was a bunch of adults and their kids. Maybe the kids would make friendship bracelets. No, I looked over one day and there were all these adults sitting around, men and women, making friendship bracelets. And so it's like February, I'm 43 years old and I have like all my <laughs> Zoom calls. I have this like friendship bracelet, but it was so cool. And they were having a very different interaction with each other than they would have if they didn't have just the, the this thing to do. And on a similar note, I also brought a hula hoop and I was like, I don't know what's going to happen with that. And everyone started learning how to hula hoop, the grownups, and including like the least likely person I would have thought would have hula hooped. He was hula hooping and asking for other people to give him, you know, coaching and hula hooping. Um, I actually once threw a party where I brought a hula hoop into it. And then two people started hula hooping and got married afterwards. Now there's two kids. So you never know. But I think it's Who's- interesting to this- <laughs> to start to think about like just what can you introduce like when Lori and I did this sing-along I, I came over to her residential college over the summer and we manufactured fun which sounds impossible right like I, I myself had doubts because I'm like okay we're going to be sitting alone in the living room you can see the lighting in Lori's background even though like it's very bright and I remember you were like do you mind if I turn the lights down a bit and I was like no I don't Mm-mm, don't mind <laughs> but as soon as I had that that microphone and the first song came on and we were singing along it just became so fun so I think there's also often a leap of faith that we need to take you know create the setting but then have that faith to just try to let go and see what happens because I remember it was like literally the first line of the song that we sang and I was like that's so fun having so much fun and then Lori basically had to kick me out <laughs> this is, and this is basically all just a ploy to get to be invited back to do the sing-along again. Um, 
the no, last I know thing I want like, you know my you know my incentive no um, more than me the fact that you like dove into it so beautifully it's like oh fun guru <laughs> oh Lori, it was beautiful everything about that was beautiful <laughs> um i want to there's a question here i'm going to start wrapping up but i was interested in your answer for this myself as well which is what are some of the best studies you've found that connect fun and happiness to overall well-being which i think is really making the case for happiness and fun like why should we care <laughs> so what are some of the research shows yeah, I mean, you know, the, the research kind of just goes through and lists the kinds of things that matter for happiness. We talked about like social connection totally matters for happiness. The more socially connected you are, the happier you are. Presence, mindfulness, the more in the moment you are, the happier you are. There's, there's a paper that's literally called a wandering mind is an unhappy mind, right? The more you're just kind of there and present, the happier you are. And I think the more we can get out of judgment, the more you engage in self-compassion, the more you can be playful, allow yourself to grow, the happier you are. And Catherine's lovely work has found that fun is the confluence of all of those things. And it in and of itself, when you're engaging in fun, produces positive emotion, different positive emotion than just like chilling out and resting, like active joy, delight, positive emotion, right? And so like, it seems like a life filled with more fun is gonna get you both of these two parts of happiness. You're gonna have more positive emotion in the moment and you're gonna feel like you have a life that's filled with more meaning and so on. I think it also makes you feel more time affluent. There's not good evidence on that, but just anecdotally, when I can take time to take a break and then I go back to my work, even though I've lost time, I'm not feeling as frantic. I've kind of given myself the opportunity to just like, oh, you know, I'm just kind of messing around. And that I think you bring into your work life in a positive way too. So yeah, so lots of evidence that engaging in these parts of fun are really critical for well-being. Well, that brings me to my to my final question. I apologize we didn't get to all the questions in the chat, but I did want to make sure to ask you one question that I, I used as a teaser for this webinar, which is if we were to walk by your office on a random afternoon, what might we hear and why? Um, I think you'd hear the sounds of students screaming because they'd be louder outside my courtyard than you'd be in my office. Um, but I hope you hear me working on my new podcast and giving lots and lots of good insight into how you can all be happier. Well, um, that's, 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 that's true, but I'm talking about Guitar Hero. Oh, the Guitar Hero. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, yeah, let me get back. I was like, Where's I'm like, going? yeah, yeah, yeah. Everybody listen to Lori's podcast. She's got a whole season right now about <laughs> negative emotions. No, the whole thing's great, but I, but I'm, I want to ask her about something totally different, <laughs> but you should listen to it because Jen, actually, if you, you can drop a, li a link into the happiness lab podcast while Lori's talking, that'd be super. <laughs> I was referring to something I shared with her, which is that, you know, in, in the midst of a work day, it's hard to figure out what you can do. That's sort of really fun. And, and through my work with Catherine, I figured out that some of my fun factors are ridiculous things, music, but where I don't have to play an instrument because I'm not necessarily instrument savvy yet and so on. Um, and, and I kind of resonate with like fake social connection, like video games where there's other agents and things like that. And so I've started playing uh, guitar hero, um, I've been playing the guitar, but I also recently bought the Guitar Hero Band version. So I have the drums that I'm learning how to play. Um, and it's so fun. And the beauty of this is like, it, it maximizes your time confetti. Cause sometimes you only have five minutes, but you can get through a good rendition of Kickstart My Heart by Motley Crue in a five minute period, run in, turn on the PlayStation, play Kickstart My Heart and run back for the Zoom meeting. And this has been transformative for my like work life. Cause it means that again, in these tiny moments where otherwise I'd be like, oh, I'm gonna check my email. Or I'm gonna look at something dumb on the internet or some piece of news that's only gonna make me more anxious. Like I hear kickstart my heart. <laughs> it's an amazing song and it's got this crazy solo at the end. And I just come to the Zoom meeting like beaming such that people are like, oh, you, what, what happened? Like you're in such a good mood. <laughs> and I don't wanna be like, I just played Molly Crew on Guitar Hero. But like, that's really what happened, so. Um, so that might not be everyone's fun factor, but the key is like, I think all of us with a little bit of time and reflection and energy can figure out, okay, what is that for each of us? What can we do in those little moments of time confetti that feel really fun? You know, yours might be having, you know, a thing of Play-Doh around and you make something goofy with Play-Doh and take a screenshot of it and send it to your partner. Um, you know, it could be a, a gazillion different things based on your fun factors, but if you figure out what that is and you really allow yourself without judgment, the ability to do it promise you, you'll feel happier. I could not agree more. So thank you, Lori, so, so, so much for this. This was true fun in the full sense of the word. I get to say that because I'm, I'm a fun <laughs> expert. And um, everyone, thank you for making the time to join us today. The suggestions that we have, or I have <laughs> just started using the royal we, Lori, you were included in that, but 
for you to experiment with this week is just what Lori said. Try to see if there's someone you could just play around with in these interstitial moments in your day that might bring you a little bit of delight. Continue to play around with that delight practice idea. I also shared some <laughs> worksheets, super fun sounding, with you, including a fun times journal, which is basically to help you start to notice more moments of playfulness and connection and flow that already exist in your life, with the, in your day, with the idea that the more you can name them and notice them, the more you'll benefit from them. It's also a great thing to do before bed in the time or your interstitial moments when you might have been scrolling through your phone. Last week, I sent out the fun magnets finder, which is part of the fun audit that Lori is talking about, which is basically identifying some of your past fun experiences and then pulling out some of the characteristics that unite those experiences to give you new ideas for things to try. So those are some things to, to start with and play around with. Next week is um, Rebel, which is one of my favorite concepts, uh, which I also could talk to Lori about. Um, but I just got confirmation that our guest next week is going to be Kelly Leonard, who is an, a, the executive director of Improvisation and Applied Insights at Second City in Chicago which basically means he's a super creative guy who's got lots of ideas about how we can break out of our boring adult mindsets, become more playfully rebellious, and in so doing, have more fun and become more creative, effective people. He's personally responsible for deciding to hire Tina Fey and Amy Poehler. So clearly he's got good judgment. Um, and I know he's going to have some hands-on stuff for us to experiment with, not embarrassing stuff, God help us, but just things to play around with. So I encourage you to sign up for that as well. But again, thank you for making time. Happy Valentine's to everyone. And uh, Lori, thank you. I can't wait to, to continue our personal fun intervention. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. All right. Thanks, everyone. Take care.